your first Bach recording or, or sonata in, in your yes. repertoire was the C major. Yes. The C major. Yes. Yes. And that is amazing because it is definitely the most abstract, complicated yes. structure. Yes. yes. So, uh, that's, that's was right. this the influence of, of... The C major, the C major did me both a lot of good and a certain amount of harm because I just didn't know how to go about those three and four string chords. I played it obviously very well because it had, the Germans were overwhelmed and everybody else with, when I played it in, in Berlin, I remember that 29, autumn 29, I played it very well. However, I got around it as I got around most things. I mean, I, even when I hear, uh, like uh, you've allowed me to hear, Bruno, the, um, uh, you know, the, the bumblebee, the vol du bourdon, I say, my, my God, did I really play that, that well, that fast? Because I never methodically went to conquer that technique. I just had, obviously, a certain gift of, above all, of wanting to, and wanting to do everything I could, and working very hard, and of playing it again and again, figure out, figuring out the fingerings and so on, and had a gift. But it still, to me, is like a, a gift that I haven't worked for. And so it seems quite surprising that I did. So I got around the C major in the same way as I got around everything else and played as a Paganini concerto with ease and with authority and uh, with, uh, you know, what I loved, the Italian aria and everything that could make it sing. And, and that happened in, in this extraordinary way without ever thinking how and why and working away at it's only later I began. So um, the C major did me harm in the, that my bow got rather hard as a result of doing those chords, probably in a way that was more strenuous than it need have been. And uh, then I had to undo that to play pieces like, you know, Capice Viennois and Schoen uh, Rosmarin and those. But wanting to do them all, I did them all quite, uh, quite well. But I remember a period in Basel in 29 when I was really getting to master the C major and couldn't play the Rondo Capriccioso because I had worked too hard on the C major. It's extraordinary. There is definitely a, a, a very quick evolution. Very quick? A very quick evolution. Yes. Because you made two recordings of the C major sonata in yes. Bach. Three, I think. Well, uh, um, yes. four or five. Yes. But uh, I mean, in, uh, you know, one was at the age of 12 and the other yes. one at the age of 15. Yes. And between the two, there is a radical rethinking of the work. Yes. yes. Uh, well, I've experimented with three different ways of holding the uh, counter melody, which, as you know, is in minims, chromatic. Once, I think, which is probably the best way, holding it like a dotted crotchet, a dotted quarter, perhaps just a, a semiquaver, a sixteenth added to the quarter, so long enough to hear the change in harmony in the voice in the leading voice. Mm -hmm. Because after all, uh, you want to hear uh, the counter melody uh, long enough to hear that where the, where the theme is going. For instance, if you have uh, the two voices come at the very beginning, well, A in the counter voice, G sharp against the E, 
the DNC, and then G natural. Well, there's no, the G natural doesn't fulfill its function unless it is heard, even for a short time, with the C sharp, which goes to D major. Especially as the C sharp is a new C sharp, the theme has C natural first and then C sharp in the same bar. Um, so the C sharp is, must be heard with a G. So I never faltered on that. I never accepted the additions that had the chords merely as quavers or semi-quavers. Mm -hmm. That didn't, the others are voice, pa, 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 the chromatic. And I wanted them to be of equal length. Not, so that had to be worked out throughout. And that is, I think, the most, after all. Then there came a time when I wanted to experiment with holding the whole of the half tone, mm -hmm. the uh, half note, the whole minimum. And you can do that in certain places, but not everywhere. Mm. So even though I recorded it that way, I don't think that is a, a universal solution. I think the universal solution is the one of a quarter or a crotchet with a semiquaver long enough to hear the change of harmony on the beat. And that you can do pretty well throughout the piece. Were you conscious of such things when you, know, when you oh, first yes. played it? Yes. Oh, yes, very much so. I was very conscious of, of these nights because I wanted everything I did was both from the earliest days, both very spontaneous, but also uh, I wanted to, to be able to justify it. It's a curious Talmudic heritage of wanting... Uh, Diana says today, I always want to be right. Well, I acknowledge when I'm wrong, but I do want to be right to the extent that I can justify it black and white, legally, you know, in the Bible it says this. And I know that I'm right, that this is the minimum length that those notes must be. And everything else that every other editor has done is wrong. <laughs> because they cut the note short, they cut uh -huh. the chord, they treat it as chords, instead of treating the notes as counterpoint, mm -hmm. which is mad violinistic aberration. So there are a few things of which I'm absolutely sure I'm right. But there are many things that I am not sure about and where I don't pretend to be. Diana says the most used words in my vocabulary are I don't know. Well, that's a fact. I, I don't. But that's what you're saying about the interpretation of Bach is very revealing because it seems to me that not only were these works not known at that time. The only? Not only were these works not known. Yes. You know, the sonatas yes. and partitas. Yes. Were hardly ever played. Ever played, yes. Uh, but this, the fact that you had a contrapuntal yes. thinking about it yes. uh, has had definitely an enormous influence on your, on, on your approach in That's general. True. Yes. Because well, I have never been a vertical man in any way, neither Kush class, uh, you know, strata, um, uh, what they call strata. I've always been a horizontal man. And in music too, and in, with people, every person has their voice. Every person adjusts in a kind of courteous way, as in the old laws of counterpoint, resolutions, and, uh, and false relations and um, the minimum motion required in order to adjust to a new harmony, the held notes as many as possible. Those are counterpuntal. I hadn't thought about it until you brought it up now, Bruno. My analysis of uh, musical works has been in the first contrapuntal and melodic, in the second, rhythmic, and in the third, harmonic. Mm -hmm. Most pianists and many musicians proceed from the harmonic first. Mm -hmm. And I think, however important that is, 
and however much I regret that I don't play the piano, I still feel that music is the art, an art in time. It's the only art except poetry that exists in time and dance, of course. But for the ear, it is the art of time. And therefore, it must move. You must be carried by the horizontal. The vertical is an intrusion, in a way, either there to color the horizontal or to give different, uh, different effects, sound effects, harmonic effects. But for me, music is, first of all, rhythm, secondly, melody, counterpoint, and finally, harmony. Did it have um, an effect on the fact that when you discovered Indian music or... The... Yes, I think that's interesting. You're bringing up all kinds of cross relationships because that may have been one reason that attracted me <clears throat> so to Indian music, because it is music for the violin. The violin is a single voice instrument, mm -hmm. however many double stops you can play. And Indian music, with its absolute perfect fifth, which does not allow of modulations any more than our medieval or, uh, organs allowed of modulations. Mm -hmm. And that's why the pieces were all in one key. Even Bach's 24 uh, <clears throat> preludes and fugues are still in one, each is in one key. The idea of modulating between keys was not yet uh, very, although it was made possible by the uh, by the, uh, you know, <clears throat> tempered scale, well, tempered, yes. mm. which has its great advantages harmonically, but its great disadvantages from uh, the purity of the interval. And that's what attracted me as a violinist to Indian music, was the sheer perfection of the intonation and the purity of that constant fifth against which everything was measured. It's like the parallax of the eyes. You can tell distance, exact distance, by the two points, by the two eyes. And the same thing with the fifth, the two notes. Against that, the smallest, the smallest uh, change of pitch, a sixteenth of a tone, is immediately audible and sounds like a tremendously expressive pain, you know? Whereas we have lost that, we deal with the rough fifth adjusted to the division of the Pythagorean comma over the 12 notes. So each fifth is a little shorter. And that means that we have lost the capacity for that subtle reaction to what an Indian would send an Indian musician into ecstasy. There's a chapter I would like to examine with you, which is the, the one of the composers that you have met, yes. with whom you have worked, from whom you have commissioned pieces. And of course, there are many, many of them. But who was the first, the very first composer that you met? The very first composer was Ernest Bloch. And that again was a kind of symbolic, because it was one of the last composers of whom I commissioned, just before he died, two solo sonatas. And uh, the first composer who dedicated a piece to me, I had met him a few weeks before in San Francisco. He was in charge of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Lived in San Francisco. And uh, I'd met him at an evening that was arranged by the first violist of the San Francisco Orchestra, a man called Lichtenstein. Very sweet man who gave me my first mute, a very beautifully carved out ebony, black ebony mute, I remember. And uh, Bloch was there, and he asked me to play, and Bloch liked it. And then a few days later, there was a knock at a door around 10 o'clock in the morning at, on, at 1043 Steiner Street, where we lived. And I was about seven, I suppose. And that was Bloch coming with the aboda ink barely dry, to Yehudi Menuhin. Well, I was, 
I'd never had any piece dedicated to me, let alone by a great composer. And therefore, Bloch remained the image of a great composer for me, you know, like the, um, uh, the, um, the, fir the first uh, live thing that a duck sees when it's born becomes its mother. And if by any chance it's an old man, <laughs> that is its mother. So that for me, Bloch remained the composer. And the, um, it was a very great moment. And I played it, and then I played it a great deal in my programs. And uh, we remained very close friends throughout his life. We met several times in Paris. In Ville d'Avre, he came and played his uh, Jewish service at the piano and singing all the voices, Enesco and my parents and sisters and I, with Bloch at the piano, hanging over him, and Enesco transported, think a very great work, a very great composer. It was an afternoon in Ville d'Avre. It could only have been in the 32, 33, some around that time, 34. And uh, of course, Bloch had worked very closely with Edmond Flegg. And uh, who wrote the um, script uh, to Macbeth, Bloch's opera, which was done in uh, Milan some years ago again. And of course, Fle Edmond Flegg wrote the script to Enesco's Oedipus. Mm -hmm. And um, so Edmond Flegg was the uh, mm -hmm. meeting point between a, a wonderful man, a great poet, a great writer, a great Jew. And uh, all his family were exterminated. But when he came back to Paris after the war, of course, he reclaimed his lovely old apartment, un rue Quai aux Fleurs, un Quai aux Fleurs. Lovely position uh, just behind Notre Dame. Bloch was a very entertaining character because he never stopped talking. And whatever he said was interesting. And he looked like a prophet from the Old Testament. He was a good photographer and used the early Leicas, the uh, miniature cameras, which he took along every year to Switzerland, where he was born. He was, he was a Swiss. He was from Genève, Geneva, and came back with these wonderful portraits of this prophet against a mountain, you know, or atop a mountain against the sky. Uh, very dramatic photographs. And, um, there's one that he took of you, actually. Yes, that's right. That's right. And then uh, when I played his concerto and went over it with him, I said, and the second movement, which is very haunting, very, very mystical, very otherworldly, beginning. And I said, where does that, where, where is that? That's Red Indian, he said. Another composer who is linked with the Ville d'Avray period, I should think, is uh, Elgar. Is who? Elgar. Elgar, of course. And uh, we brought him to Ville d'Avray for the first performance of his concerto in Paris, which I gave. Enesco had rehearsed the orchestra with his usual commitment, selflessness, so that Elgar would find it. And in fact, the morning of the concert, Elgar, for the first time, took the baton. We played the concerto through, and there was absolutely nothing, nothing Elgar had to say, nothing at all. It was a beautiful performance, because Enesco had, had rehearsed it. But the story, of course, behind the the, that legendary recording of the yes. concerto is also the... It, isn't it for you the, the first um, uh, contact that you had with England? Uh, not quite. The first contact was in 1929, in November, when I played at the Royal Albert Hall and Queen's Hall. Queen's Hall, I played Bruch. No, the first concerts in London were 29 with Fritz Busch. Mm -hmm. Fritz Busch, and I did the Beethoven and the Brahms. And um, 
We lived in the same hotel. Now, I remember once going up the stairs, Fritz Busch, a very small hotel in Mayfair, where there were still coal fires and beautifully starched, white-dressed maids. You know, very simple hotel, not expensive, not one of the, not the Savoy or anything like that, or Claridge's, but the, it was still English style from the old period. And every few hours, the maid came in impeccably in white starched uh, outfit, maid's uniform, to uh, clear the coal ashes from the grate and set the fire. And uh, I w walked up to Fitzbush's room, which was above uh, my father's and mine, and uh, knocked at the door, and there was no one. So I opened the door, uh, because I heard music. And there was Fitzbush conducting to the gramophone recording of some work that he was doing. <laughs> it's very interesting, I thought. And uh, he was a very dear man, and it was with him I played. It was then I recorded the Bruch Concerto with Sir Landon Ronald. That was my first visit. So, and then after that, I came to England every year. By, that, by the time Fred Geisberg of uh, His Master's Voice, not yet EMI, uh, wrote my father asking if I could, if I would like to record the Elgar Concerto. Uh, I had already been in England three years, three successive seasons. So I was already accepted. And, but um, what marked that first performance of my first English work in England was that it opened my heart to the great subtleties and refinements of the English thought, of their emotional sense, of their sense of uh, nobility and grandeur at the same time, with no aggression, uh, nothing military, and uh, they understood that I understood them. It was a moment that established, I think, from that moment on, established the plant of the seed, which has now, how many years later, 32, 55 years later, uh, made me part of the British structure. Was the, the, uh, the meeting with the composer, Edgar, something, you didn't know the work, you didn't no, know? No, I received the work after agreeing to it. You see, I said, yes, yes, yes. And uh, that was, must have been about two months before the recording. And uh, I studied it. You, and you, you learned the concerto in three months? Yes, yes. And uh, it's, it's an enormous concerto. No, no. I took it to UNESCO, and all I remember UNESCO saying, uh, with the second theme, when I played it, he said, that's very, very English. He said, no, it mustn't be uh, as passionate, but it must be deep feeling. It must reserve, have a certain elegance and dignity, and at the same time, deeply feeling, very free and uh, wistful. He said, that, all I remember is that that's very English. And then I understood gradually what he meant. You're talking about the ta da ta da 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 Heave, f finally, acceptance, resignation, and yet carry ta 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 It's a wonderfully ecstatic, dreamy, and very real. It's, uh, you could tear it apart if you wanted, and you must play it very freely. But unless uh, Elgar indicates how freely it should be, and yet, it must have its own own pace and not be exaggerated. Um, so when I began to understand that, I had won the complete 
trust of the of the British. I was a victim of the type of thinking which to me now is anathema. Wherever I see it, whether in violent playing, in diplomacy, in, in habits, whatever it is, it is the rigid, the idea that to establish an order, you begin with the motionless. You begin with the what doesn't move. Then you add movement. You begin with the first position on the violin. And then you, you don't explain anything because it's called the first position. You begin with the first. And you press finger down. You don't know how to hold the violin. And then afterwards, you will add motion. Instead of realizing the world began with motion, people begin with the solid. They begin in their minds with the something secure either all men are terrible or all men are equal or, or some theory, something that is rigid. And uh, whether it's political theory or religious theory, it's that rigidity. Now, it's idiotic to begin in the first position because, because it's the farthest away from the body. The violin is heaviest there. It's also bad to begin near the shoulder of the violin because then you're inclined to hold the violin and support it. So you begin in between, and you don't begin with a position, you begin with motion right away. And so on, this kind of thinking. My, one of my main motives in life seems to be to correct for myself, first of all, and then for as many as I can reach, a false notion of thinking, basic idea of thinking, as if the body were a statue, and then you breathe into it motion. So motion, first things come last, last things come first, and all comes together. So that um, also the fact that it's an instrument that one cannot brutalize. You don't get anything out, because if you're dealing with something which has to vibrate, as soon as you hold it tightly, you inhibit the vibrations. As soon as you squeeze, as soon as you oppress a human being, you destroy the opportunity of dialogue, of giving and receiving. And the same with the violin. The violin is supposed, said to rest on the shoulder, because that's obvious. Everyone can see a shoulder but few people can see a collarbone. <laughs> and all the most crude and obvious approaches I was subjected to during those first eight months of study with the, that teacher in San Francisco, an old-fashioned teacher who got results. He could, he did, you get results. You can run a country with slave camps. You get results. They work. But you can't really, I, my feeling is you can't become the kind of violinist that I admire and which exists today more than before because people are more evolved in their thinking than before. Before it took a genius to be a Paganini or perhaps a Corelli or maybe not or maybe those pe people played just like that. But then there came this oppressive uh, approach where you only got results by whipping. And uh, that has been against my whole attitude to life. Then I looked for the truth. And I found some truths. For instance, probably everyone knew the truth, and everyone who played the violin already did it beautifully. But I had to find these things out for myself against a uh, very strong uh, how should I say, environment of uh, security, false security, and, and against my own ambition or with my own ambition to play. So that finally 
I realized the violin does not rest on the shoulder, it rests on the, on the collarbone. The bone which connected with the violin communicates the vibration. The bone which uh, is a harder substance than the shoulder. Besides, as anyone can see, as soon as you raise the shoulder against the chin, you have a crazy kind of diagonal and it lifts the, uh, the elbow away from the violin. Then you have those violins which, which, who play with their thumbs right above the, fingerboard, the um, fingerboard, the neck of the violin. And instead of the shoulder feeding the, the flow into the fingers, you have it inhibiting. And so they get over it you can get over so many things, so many obstacles, and still play the violin very beautifully and make it communicative. It's extraordinary how badly you can play the violin and still communicate, if you really want to. I mean, but even so, <clears throat> the feeling of continuity in motion, in other words, the economy of motion consists in not allowing any motion to be wasted. If there is already a motion, you don't push it. You don't say, now I'm going to do something, if it's already there. The same in walking. Uh, I can illustrate that later. The, the fact that if, there, if you play with everything balanced and you can move each uh, joint. You can roll the violin between thumb and finger. You can feel that that this is a pendulum, the elbow is a pendulum, that the shoulder can can move, so that uh, the if the farther the hand goes away, the lower and backwards the shoulder goes. You don't do that. You always compensate. You always do that, that, and. One of the first exercises without the violin, after I've made the children walk on all fours, is to raise the collarbone and lower the shoulder. It's perfectly possible. One becomes gradually aware. Of. I can feel that rising. I can feel that lowering. That's one of the first exercises. And then the ease of the neck so that the the neck just touches, it doesn't clutch the violin, it touches it in such a way that it can slide on the, on the chin wrist and that it can compensate the motion of the hands to, so that there is that feeling, pulling back, not, not that, pulling back. You have all these violin etudes, the books with various kinds of scales, they all give you excellent exercises, but no one, not one, tells you how to do them or what are the preliminary steps. I'm always interested in the very first step. Where does life come in? Where does consciousness begin, you know, in evolution, in nature? I believe that there's consciousness inherent in everything, but it develops with the size of the mind, the experience. But um, this idea of the first steps being right, prenatal music, singing, you know the gypsy father sings on the belly of his pregnant wife before the, well, before the child is born. All of these, and I've always admired the natural violinists because there is such a thing as a natural violinist. I mean, the gypsies who grow up with the environment and play, they play. They haven't played scales. They haven't learned. I admire that, and I know it's possible. And many great violinists have had this gift. And so I'm always amazed when I realize that I did play as much of, as a virtuoso as, as anybody, and yet it wasn't that I was trained for that. I, it just, just, I try to understand when I was doing the Paganini Perpetual Motion on the tour of England as the last piece of the program, every night, 
in the, that summer in Paris, in Ville d'Avray, I decided to be on the safe side. I better be able to play it several times. And I used to play three and four times with repeat, without stopping, just to play it through, to build my resistance. And it worked. I did it perfectly well. Then came, of course, the... Uh, <clears throat> I was still playing uh, largely instinctively until after the uh, sabbatical when I had to begin. And then I began playing quite, quite well at my, at my best, that whole tour when I introduced the Schumann Concerto and the one before, before I was married, uh, the first time in 37 to 38. Hefziba and I were playing the Rondo Brillante of, of Schubert, you know, and tossing it off with, uh, and everything happened. And, but I was still growing and things were still happening uh, in that natural, instinctive way. I do enjoy as great a variety. I liked, I love variety. I don't like any, you know, to be limited to any single way of expression. Inesco already had an incredible variety of, uh, of vibrato. Uh, and I try to get, now when I conduct, to get varieties of attack. It's surprising how that is often ignored in violin playing. There are attacks that are like, I say, put the bow on the string and pull. That's, that's a cutting sound. Then there is the landing with no accent at all. Then there is the slight weight on wah, wah. And so few orchestras can do a forte piano. No wah. And, um, and then different strokes, strokes that are smooth, strokes that are uh, have a crescendo in them. Almost very few orchestras, and you have to arrange your bowings accordingly, can make a crescendo on a down bow. No. Because, you see, holding like this, you hold, you hold the weight away from the... by allowing this to drop onto the first, first finger, you can get more weight without strain, it's not, it's not that. You have to play the violin from height. You can't hang on to the violin and hang on and have a solid violin. You play it from above. You have to have space which you can rise above the note, above the finger. And I have the first violin it's early, first lessons and first months, play Pianissimo, not try for hard, just perfectly piano, allowing, just carrying it, and playing pianissimo and moving the hands like that. Once you have that, then you have the vibrato and you have the change of position and you have the trill, just, just, just like that, because it, it just falls. And it's the same thing. And it enables you to vibrate, as you can see on some of the performances, throughout a phrase. You see, the, the vibrato continues. <laughs> 